Well, last week we began uh, a whole new series of study, maybe a new journey in our uh, journey through the Word of God. And we began to look into the what we call the pastoral epistles. These were letters that Paul had written uh, to give pastoral advice, and specifically to uh, two individuals. One would be Timothy, his prodigy. Um, he referred to Timothy as his true son of the faith. They had a very unique and close relationship. And Paul references him and speaks with him in very high, respectful terms about 20 times in his letters. So we know that there was a real intimacy and closeness between Paul and Timothy. And the other was towards Titus, which we know less about, but um, Titus was certainly one of those entrusted emissaries, someone whom Paul, like Timothy, would send to represent him to different churches that he had planted and oftentimes to address problems that would arise. And that's exactly what the letter to Titus is about, where Titus is sent to the Isle of Crete, where the church was really <clears throat> struggling with uh, overcoming some, some we call them cultural proclivities uh, in how they interpreted and understood the Word of God. And this is always a challenge. And Tim Titus was sent there to kind of create a biblical standard of behavior that would govern over the leadership of the church. And that's why uh, this becomes important. Basically, these are basically in those in these the letters of 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, and particularly in Titus, there's some like 20, 21 different uh, behavioral characteristics that Paul said need to be points of maturity in the life of those who lead. Uh, he had a real concern, as he would say to Timothy, that you not put a novice, somebody as a new convert, or we might even interpret it as new to you, unknown to your community of faith, that you put them in a position of leadership and influence because you don't know exactly, uh, well, he said they'll fall into the snare of the devil, which was pride. So we're all aware of that. So this is critically important in terms of understanding a church structure and government and organization. But as I pointed out last week, it's also important for us to realize that all he's really talking about is here is being a mature believer. And there are some people who uh, have contended themselves with a lack of maturity in their spiritual lives. They get saved. They know just enough to kind of keep inside, play inside the boundaries, but they never really felt like they've really thrived in their relationship with God. And part of that may be false perception on your part. We tend to be very, very critical of ourselves, far more than other people might be. But also it may be the realization that we have really been afraid to really entrust ourselves completely and fully to the Lord. And so when we look at these characteristics, don't think of them as something that needs to be applied or, or even worse yet, a lens that you need to view the spiritual leadership in your church and therefore judge and evaluate them. Uh, basically, we would say to you, as, as Jesus said, physician, heal thyself. But the reality is that we need to recognize that God is calling us, each and every one of us, to a pursuit of God that leads to a maturity in our faith. Uh, the biggest obstacle we have to that is that oftentimes we have to become humbled in order to be usable. And uh, uh, that's something that you and I really, really struggle with because humility is not a natural trait to human beings. It's, it's really a gifting that God gives us. If we can be humble, it's because <clears throat> God has humbled us. And we resist being humbled on all sorts of lay ways. We we go through life always trying to be uh, at the front of the line. I noticed this yesterday, and and my, as my wife and I were shopping in Costco, and uh, of course the lines were very very long. It was very crowded and congested, and the you know the thought that came to my mind is how can I niggle my way up to the front and avoid the crowd and get ahead of everybody else, and. Uh, my wife, you know, turned to me, looked at me and said, you know, we were just talking about patience this morning. <laughs> and both of us were kind of grimacing because we understand we just need to just kind of tone it down to relax and to realize we'll get through the line and everybody else is struggling as much as we are to get through the holiday seasons and all the buying and returning and all the things that go with it. So, um, yeah, we just needed to chill out a bit. But that's always the challenge, isn't it? To, to take ourselves out of the first place and put ourselves into the right place. I don't say to take it out of first and put yourself in last, but you know, God knows where you fit in and you can trust him to make sure that you, you find the right place in line. It's always dangerous jumping cues, as they say in England, you know, people try to find the shortest line because I've just found oftentimes the shortest line doesn't get me through the fastest. And so ultimately, 
Uh, we need to be patient and take our time and trust that God, who is the Lord of time, the master of time, will get us to where we need to be when we need to be there. And hopefully he'll do it in a way that we're comfortable most of the way through the journey. But anyway, last week we looked at the first four verses of 1 Timothy where Paul kind of gave the introduction and uh, laid out some of the groundwork. But in verse 5, he begins by saying, but the goal of our instruction, in other words, the reason why I'm doing what I do and, the, and what should be the motivation behind our teaching is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So these three things, he said, should be the motivating desires in any of us in terms of our trying to communicate our faith, whether it's to other believers or even to non-believers. It should even be what motivates us in our most intimate and personal relationships that we have with husbands and wives and children and family and so forth. Because we basically need to operate first and foremost out of this love that comes from a pure heart. Um, love is one of those words that's been really kind of robbed of a lot of its value because it's tossed around so cavalierly in our culture. And uh, it's, there was a value in the Greek language that they had basically four different ways of expressing love depending on what it actually represented, whether it was just affection or whether it was just uh, possession. Uh, you know, basically many, the erotic or eros love is often just a, a, a love of wanting to possess and control and domineer and consume another. It has nothing really to do with the, the welfare or the consideration of the welfare of the other. A love of friendship or filial love is a wonderful love that you have with people that you enjoy being around. It's, it's a love that grows when you find affinity with certain people. And understanding that we don't find affinity with everybody. I mean, we have a lot in common with some people and they, they have similar life journeys and life experiences. We have great conversations with them. That's what married life and family life is supposed to be about with this shared life experience. But we also have the, those kind of relationships that are that we struggle with and we need to be dedicated to just because they are storge love. They're the love of family and connection. We have a genetic linkage. And therefore, <coughs> we have to love those people that we're related to. <coughs> yeah, still battling this cold. But the love that he's talking about here is, is uh, agape love, agapao love. It's the love that isn't based upon the value we see in the person being loved. It basically is something that comes from the heart of God and flows through us. So it's really, when we show agape love, we're imitating God's love for people. We're not uh, basically just showing ordinary love. In fact, it's the love that lays its life down for another, even if we don't even know the, the other. So he said the first and foremost thing we have to realize is that we have to be motivated by a love for those people, a care for those people, that what we want to see is their best welfare. And he says to do that from a pure heart. And a pure heart means that it's not adulterated by any other kind of motivation. You know, I, it's like the salesman who came to me and said, well, you should buy this product because it's a win-win. You win, I win. And I always hated that term because uh, anything that you do that only benefits or that you say benefits us equally usually means it benefits you more than it does me. And the reality is that we should do things because our only really overriding concern is that this is going to be a benefit to the other person. And I find that when I, when uh, people treat me that way, I'm, I'm really blessed when they say, I just want to do this because I want to bless you. I had somebody come and clear snow away from the front of my house because I couldn't get to my mailbox. And uh, it was, you know, I, I asked him what I owed him and he said, nothing. He says, it's just, I'm just doing it. I'm, it's easy. It's, I just want to do it for you. And I thought, wow, that's, that's such a blessing that somebody's saying to you, I value you enough that I want to show you through my actions. And so when he talks about doing things, he says, you know, we need to do it out of a pure heart. And I say, especially if you're a pastor and you're teaching, you need to be teaching from a heart of love towards these people. It's, you're telling them the truth. You're telling them God's truth. You're telling them what they need to hear, not necessarily what they want to hear, because you want them to experience the fullness of what God has for them. And even if that may make people angry with you or disagree with you, you're not worried about that as much as you are saying, but this is a truth that you need to hear. It's like Solomon said in Proverbs that uh, secret, uh, open rebuke is better than secret love. Telling people the truth is better than, you know, loving them but not telling them the truth. Because if we need to tell somebody the truth and we don't, then we're really not loving them at all. We're really kind of loving ourselves more so 
because we don't want to take the deal with the backflash, you know, of people getting frustrated or angry with us because they don't want to hear the truth. I hope that wasn't too complicated. Anyway, we'll pick this up tomorrow as we continue looking at verse 5 and looking at the continuing uh, motivations, the heart goals that we should have as we serve the Lord on a daily-to-day -day basis.